I'm Glenn Reichert, Founder and Chief Technology Officer of US Ignite, and I'd like to talk to you about computing at the speed of life. Now, as everyone knows, Ruslan puts together a great conference and has a lot of great help doing that, and I would like nothing better than to be there with you folks right now, but unfortunately, life became what it was, and I'm unable to get there, and I'm leaving you a video instead. But I hope that Monetech goes wonderfully. I can see that there's a lot of great papers. I think that it's going to be just a terrific conference. But let me tell you a little bit about some of my thoughts on computing at the speed of life and uh, how that's come about from the work that we're doing at US Ignite. So let me start by saying, who is US Ignite and what are we doing and why is that making uh, something happen in the way that we think about what applications are and can do? So US Ignite is an organization that is a national innovation accelerator. The National Innovation Accelerator is looking at ways in which we can accelerate high technology coming into things that affect people's lives, things that affect public safety, education, healthcare, things that will really make a positive difference. So here are some examples. If you look at the top left corner, you'll see the ability of a public works officer to be able to understand the pipes underneath the streets in, the, in their own city. In this case, the pipes are being projected as augmented reality in 3D so that you can actually have x-ray vision, look right through the street and see the pipes and breaks and uh, water puddles that might be from a broken water pipe underneath the streets and, and um, be able to do that as if you had x-ray vision. The top of the middle picture is a picture from the North Texas Emergency Operations Center. And that's a set of drones that go up and provide Wi-Fi coverage for a wildfire area. As you may know, in the United States, we've had a lot of wildfires, especially in the U.S. West this year. And being able to have communications to wildfire workers and the firefighters in various remote areas is very important. So to be able to go and enhance public safety by being able to bring up the drones and provide communications to the firefighters is important. In the top right, you'll see these cute little critters called the Gigabots. They come out of Jonathan Wagner in Kansas City. And the Gigabots are a cost-reduced robot. And the cost reduction comes from the fact that their intelligence is streamed or beamed or projected to them. The robots are sensors and motors and communications and a battery, and that's kind of it and all of the intelligence and knowing what to do can be streamed to them. And that's of significant value because just like your Alexa speaker learns new skills all the time remotely, these robots can become smarter and learn new tricks all the time remotely because their intelligence is being streamed in. And especially if the intelligence isn't being used all the time for a robot, for example, it's plugged in charging, that same intelligence can be directed at another gigabot and it can be doing something. And these gigabots work together in swarms. Very interesting. On the bottom left is an educational application that I'll show you a video of a little bit later in this talk. In the bottom center is the uh, picture for the POWER, P-A-W-R, Platforms for Advanced Wireless Research. This is a new thing that US Ignite is taking on, and let me tell you just a little bit about that. In the Platforms for Advanced Wireless Research in POWER, US Ignite put together a consortium of about 30 institutions globally who are interested in research in advanced wireless technologies. And that interest caused them to invest $50 million in what are going to be four test beds. The National Science Foundation matched that with $50 million of their own. So there's $100 million in money and equipment that's being provided to four different test beds. Now we call them platforms instead of test beds because it's not going to be a fixed test bed. It's a platform on which experimenters can construct their own test beds. And these experimenters will be industry uh, partners. They're, they are going to be academic partners. And we hope to have a lot of um, partnerships where academics and industry folks work together on the experiments that will be run on these platforms. Two of the platforms have been named. 
you can see them here on the slide. The uh, first is the uh, Powder Renew effort out of Salt Lake City with the support of Rice University. They're looking for six and a half acres of downtown Salt Lake City and all of its buildings and echoes and multi-path to be used to try out things like massive MIMO and a software-defined waveforms to see what really works in urban canyons and how much MIMO can we actually do. They're going to try up to 100 by 100 MIMO. 100 antennas, same frequency. 100 receiving antennas, same frequency. Can we separate out all 100 signals? Should be very, very interesting to see how all that research works out. The other one is the Cosmos Project. That's in New York City. It's in the Upper West Side of Manhattan called Silicon Harlem. And Silicon Harlem, working together with Rutgers University, uh, New York University, NYU, and Columbia University, are doing uh, another set of experiments that mainly focus on very high frequencies, millimeter wave, and actually all the way up to optical, and doing that with very, very low latency, microsecond latencies, and very, very high bandwidths, which are possible when you have data rate, when you have uh, frequencies in use that are that high. So two very different uh, but very complementary um, platforms that have been signed so far. And uh, US Ignite is right now soliciting for the other two platforms that will be somewhere in the United States. Uh, and we're looking for things that will add diversity. So maybe somebody will have something that's location-based or agriculturally based or um, addresses unique advanced wireless issues that are uh, of interest to rural areas or maybe near um, military bases. In any case, uh, we look forward to two more of these platforms that will have a very big impact on the wireless research that provides 6G, 7G, things that are too far out for industry to be doing in a big way, but they're very interested in collaborating with academics on cooperative research in those areas. So that's what's happening on the Power uh, Project. I think it's going to be very, very interesting going forward. And then on the bottom right, uh, you can see a map of the United States with uh, 25 cities, including one in Australia, Adelaide, and uh, there's uh, going to be one announced next year in Canada to add to that map. And here's that map on a little bit bigger size. Uh, you can see that uh, the ones in blue are the ones that have been added during 2018. And we expect another crop of uh, communities to be added during 2019. So these are communities that we call smart gigabit communities. They've been selected because they have cooperative groups working in civic leadership, industry leadership, and academic leadership uh, in those communities where they come together and work. That triad of civic, industry, and academic leadership produces some of the best and most effective smart city applications. And US Ignite is particularly interested in those that use new technologies, technologies that may have come out of scientific research and might uh, not be commercialized yet. If it's already commercialized, the commercial folks can go ahead and make those things happen. But for academic research, uh, US Ignite works on helping to transition that into startups, into existing companies, um, into um, operations of a government organization, whatever it takes in order to sustain that and make it a permanent improvement for the citizens of that community. So that gives you a pretty good idea of some of the things that US Ignite is up to. Let me show you a quick video talking about how US Ignite gets that done. We're in Kansas City with 1,700 attendees from 400 different cities and 250 different exhibitors. U.S. Ignite forges partnerships. We bring together academics, industry partners, community and civic leaders, people who care deeply about their community to help make the transformational change that smart and connected communities can provide. Largely what we're doing is helping cities 
define their vision as a smart city of the future. People are willing to bring these technologies in, but they have to be accessible. So the challenge is relevancy for people's lives. And once we can do that, all the other issues take care of themselves. So US Ignite is a terrific team at talking at the levels of mayor's offices, CIOs, uh, right in directly into city government. They're a perfect pipeline for that. In an area like smart and connected communities, it really all is about partnerships. US Ignite is extremely community focused. The Smart Gigabit Communities Program is a perfect example of that. And that's very consistent with NSF's vision of bringing research and innovation to communities. What we're hearing there are personal stories about people whose lives have been changed through our work. US Ignite and Smart Cities effort has been really great. They've been very supportive of us. I feel like you know, both in the education space and then just more broadly, there are a lot of really cool applications. Uh, so it's really inspirational for us uh, to yeah. come here and to see all the cool things that are happening. This is a conference of doers, people who make things happen in their communities. US Ignite has always been a place, a convening place. It's always been a clearinghouse for ideas and equipment and money and resources and people where we can go ahead and test new ideas and try things out and build demonstrations. The movement we're creating among innovative, smart communities is personal because it is directly affecting people's lives. US Ignite creates new opportunities. Relationships. Innovators. We've built a movement now. To bring life's most important connections to our communities. And that is very exciting. Now I'd like to discuss the kinds of applications and how they're different from applications which may think of as typical internet applications. Typical internet applications may use a web browser front end, uh, may have some caching in the network, typically go off to remote data centers, uh, operate with big data, big data centers. But a lot of the new applications and services that we're seeing coming out of new research, new technologies, are, have a bit more local effect and uh, are really stressing the network in different ways. Let's take a look at some of those applications so you'll see a little bit about what I mean. So let's take a look at these transportation applications. Uh, in the top right, you can see a project that uh, US Ignite is working with um, Madison, Wisconsin, one of our smart gigabit communities. And the idea is that the bus shelters have the ability to count the number of Bluetooth signals that are nearby, which gives us a rough idea of how many people might be waiting to take that bus. And dispatchers can look at how many people are waiting where and dispatch additional capacity, especially on days where traffic may not be normal because of an accident, because of an event that's happening, and to be able to do that based on data and making it data driven. Uh, on the left, you can see a project from Chattanooga, Tennessee, Dr. Mina Sartipi. And I want to show you a video from Mina talking about what she's doing here. And what you can see in the picture that you see already is that the a camera in the car ahead is being projected to the car behind it so that you can essentially see through the car ahead of you. And if there's something that's going to require braking because a, because a, student, a kid is running into the street uh, chasing a ball, it's something that you can see through the car ahead of you so that you could go and take appropriate action. That's also going to be important for platooning, as Mina explains here. My name is Mina Sartipi. I'm with University of Tennessee at Chattanooga, and I also lead the research program we have on urban science and technologies. One of the projects we're working on is on transportation. We're working on fleet management of connected autonomous vehicles in extreme urban environments. Autonomous vehicles, they're almost everywhere now. Because of the advancement in the technologies, they are accelerating, and also we are seeing them more and more. One of the things is they are focusing on each individual car. That They are equipped with a lot of sensors, and they are using those sensors to know where the car is and how can to get to its des destination. We're counting on a lot of information that it might not actually exist. Like, what if GPS failed? If maybe a sensor failed? 
we are talking about transportation, even one second delay is too much. We want to have a real-time data that can be transmitted in real time and a decision can be made. So that's where we came up with the idea of maybe we also need to allow them to be connected together and you know, talking with each other, sharing their information, sharing the information from the infrastructure and using all of that, making a more intelligent decision and be more reliable and efficient. US Ignite, uh, to me, ignites the deployment and development of applications that require gigabit internet connection. Smart cities would be um, helping improving the quality of life of citizens. We would be doing the same thing that we're doing now, but more efficiently and effectively. Majority of these technologies are focusing on how can we equip each individual car to have enough knowledge about where is it, how can get to the destination um, safely and reliably. I get to work with people that are working on the ground on these projects. They are working with the city. They are the ones that are telling us what are the problems. And what we are trying to do is really trying to help them to address this problem. And this is a collaboration that I've never done before. Like, you know, a very close relationship that we have with the society, with the community, that comes with the real problem that they are having. And we are, going, we are seeing that how can we address that? How can we help them, you know, fixing some of those issues? This slide is showing energy applications. In the top right, San Diego, a smart gigabit community, is getting real-time data from its street lights. They're installing LED street lights, which save energy, but at the same time allows them to put in environmental sensors and to also put in cameras, which are focused on public areas. And those public area cameras and the sensors can report in so that they can get ideas about uh, traffic volumes, gunshots fired, uh, interesting things happening in the microclimate, which happens in San Diego because they're close to the Pacific Ocean. And it's being a treasure trove of data that they're processing in San Diego to help with public services. At the bottom right is a picture about energy management and usage. This is another uh, project that we're doing at uh, US Ignite. And here, this is from uh, Lafayette, Louisiana and they're doing a project which helps the homeowner understand whether they're using more or less or average amounts of electricity and water at various times of the day, and to help give them clues about when they're making peak usage and how they might be able to reduce it. On the left-hand side is a picture of the electric grid in Chattanooga, Tennessee. That electric grid is now completely computer controlled over fiber optics. And in case of an outage, the power is automatically rerouted to homes down to a one block granularity. So it could be fed from the other end of the block if something happens at one end of the block. And having that all happen immediately required laying lots of fiber optics. So they said, why don't we go all the way to the meters? And once we've gone to the meters, why don't we also provide internet to the homes? And it was just announced today, actually, that 60% of all the people in Chattanooga, 60% of all the homes in Chattanooga are now subscribed to uh, gigabit fiber and 10 gigabit uh, services available in Chattanooga. That take rate is much higher than the average of 30 to 35% in cities where a non-municipal provider is doing the internet. And maybe an interesting harbinger of uh, fiber being resurgent in serving small businesses and in homes. On the next slide, uh, we're taking a look at some of the healthcare applications. And uh, again, I think they're very interesting. In the top left, you can see a case where we're taking a look at how patients are healing from um, perhaps a um, surgery that was done. So take me, I've had a surgery done on this elbow here, the Olecranon broke. I fell down, slipped on some ice, and they put it back together and I've got screws and a plate in here. And the question was, how much range of motion had I achieved? How far could I bend this arm? And initially I couldn't touch my shoulder and I couldn't straighten my arm out all the way. I still can't straighten the arm out completely, but they wanted to track to make sure I was getting more range of motion every week. So I went in and I had a professional physical therapist put on uh, heat and ice and help me to do exercises, which I was already doing at home. But those exercises uh, 
were important because they wanted to see if I was making progress. And they made pro and they measured that using a goniometer, which is a kind of a giant protractor that they would go and put on the elbow to see what that angle was. Well, Dr. Marjorie Skubik from the University of Missouri, Kansas City, in the upper left-hand corner there, is uh, showing that, in this case, they're looking at knee uh, flexion, uh, is showing the patient the kind of a movement that they would like the patient to make, and then a Microsoft Connect, which can actually measure in 3D the angle um, of that joint, is reporting back to Dr. Skubik what the achieved angle uh, is in that rehabilitation. If I could have done that for my arm, I could have saved $200 that I had to pay, uh, and I had insurance, so who knows how much the insurance had to pay every week to uh, get that measured, and I would love to have been able to do it from home. Here are some education applications. Uh, they're both interesting, so I'd like to show you a video about both of them. On the left-hand side, and the video we'll watch first, there's a microscope that uh, has a movie quality camera put on it. It's actually a 5K camera. The students are looking at a 4K screen of the uh, results. And that 4K screen is being fed at 60 frames per second so they can see all the movements of the little tendrils of the microscopic animals they're taking a look at. Let's, let's take a look for ourselves. Ever think about the micro world that surrounds us? That fascinating world that is critical to life on Earth and yet is otherwise invisible to us? Well, kids in Chattanooga, Tennessee are about to learn about this world in a whole new way. Thanks to the National Science Foundation, US Ignite, researchers at the University of Southern California, gigabit connectivity, and high resolution microscopy. Marine biologist, Professor Dave Karen has just started teaching a class at USC with remote students at STEM School Chattanooga. STEM students in Chattanooga, home to the country's first community-wide gigabit network, are experiencing biology and STEM like never before. So what's exciting is that we've taken a digital cinema camera that would normally be used for making Hollywood movies and combined it with this microscope and put it under remote control so you students in Chattanooga can actually move the image. It makes it look 3D by the different shades and different colors. The interactive high-resolution microscopy system enables researchers at USC to place live biological specimens under a digital cinema microscope and capture ultra-high-resolution movies of the microorganisms while simultaneously transmitting live, high-definition images from the microscope system System to students in the STEM class. Under the guidance of the USC biologists, STEM students can enhance their learning further by manipulating the microscope effectively at very low latency levels. When our teacher first talked to us about it, she was like, you're going to be able to control the microscope. And we were just like, oh, okay, cool. We get here and it's all these fancy controls. So you've got the big screen and we were just kind of in awe. The project represents the first to integrate digital cinema, optical microscopy, aquatic microbiology, flat panel displays, and gigabit networks into an educational environment in a scalable fashion. So this project really represents one of the first attempts at that. And here for our last example, I've got public safety. And in public safety, um, we can see a storm surge prediction. This is uh, not from the latest hurricane, but um, there are hurricanes that regularly hit the Carolinas. And this is a model that Paul Ruth from Renzi uh, has done. I think that you can find more about that from uh, Ilya, who's there at the conference. Uh, in the bottom left, uh, bottom center rather, is an, the Business Emergency Operations Center in Lafayette, Louisiana. Uh, at the uh, top left is an accident reconstruction being done in Wilson, North Carolina from a drone. And in the top center uh, is that example of looking through the pavement to see the pipes. Let's see a video on that one. I'm Driver Houston from University of Vermont. 
I'm a professor of engineering. I'm Dali Wu from the University of uh, Tennessee at Chattanooga, uh, assistant professor in computer science. My name is Hugh Liang, uh, faculty in the Computer Science Department, University of Tennessee at Chattanooga. We're applying smart cities technologies to the problems of that come with underground infrastructure, looking at the map and assess the conditions. What are issues with underground infrastructure? Well, it's the uh, lifeblood of all modern uh, cities. So you have water, electricity, gas, steam. For example, we have applications of uh, augmented reality or virtual reality based mapping of uh, underground infrastructures. So those applications, it requires high speed networking and also high performance computing. Well, at the moment we have uh, three communities involved, Burlington, Vermont, Winooski, Vermont, and Chattanooga, Tennessee. We prefer to use high speed networking as computing technologies to transmit the information about underground utilities to workers, managers, and city planners. So we want to transmit real-time information uh, to people on site. There's lots of really cool technology, but also folded into that is the ability to make a big difference for these cities, make their situations much better. Okay, enough videos, enough apps. What's different about these apps and how are they not typical compared to the applications and services that smart cities are running today? Well, on this slide, we talk about that. So what is characterizes these smart and connected community applications? And I think these are going to be the dominant future applications well, first of all, it involves devices instead of people in many cases. It's in many cases, streams of data, the streams of data from the electrodes, a stream of data from the street lights, a stream of data from the uh, headset, a stream of data from the microscope. Those streams of data, as opposed to just single points of data, I think are going to characterize future apps that they'll work on data streams. Those data streams are often useful only locally. They have locality. And locality is something we know about in computer science. We can do things about. But we haven't optimized our networks and our city systems to take advantage of that locality. And the data is often perishable. Uh, it's important to know what it is the data is right now. So if we're looking through the car ahead of us, what can they see right now? The data that they saw five minutes ago is much less important for decision making than the data that is visible right at the present time. So new kinds of data, streams, locality, perishable. And then the response times need to match the human response times involved. And that's what I mean by computing at the speed of life. Response times from these applications that match the people that need to use that information. If they're learning from the microscope, the microscope should, even though it's remote, respond at the speed of life. As the headset is moved, they should be able to see under the street exactly where they're looking at the speed at which they're looking at the speed of life. Uh, we wanna know where the people are right now at the speed of life. In all of these applications, we want to be able to make sure that the digital world can work just as quickly and effectively as the physical world. And we're beginning to see a kind of merger of the physical and digital worlds. We already have something called cyber physical systems, where there's a cyber part and a human or real part. And when there's a human in the loop, or when there's any kind of physical and cyber piece in the loop, we have a cyber physical system that I think will become more of the norm, will become more mainstream, and requires this kind of streaming information that's often very localized and that can be very perishable. So all of the above point to things that don't have a lot of latency. And right now, if you go to a remote distant data center, you're going to find 30, 40, 50, 60, 70, 80 milliseconds of latency even without the 
the compute at the data center, just in getting the data through the network, through the peering points, to the data center, and then getting that data back. So it, it makes it difficult to do that kind of remote computation. In addition, it's expensive to send streams of information continuously upstream and downstream, especially when the number of devices reporting in the new world of Internet of Things is exploding as fast as it is. So as a result, there's sort of two good reasons not to use the current model of a distant data center, north-south computing, where things go from the local place to the remote place. And think about something that's much more east-west, where the data is being interchanged within a community. Don't send it to a distant data center. We can now get the same kind of economy of scale in a city that you used to be able to get at a national data center only a decade ago. So we can get the economy of scale that we need, come very close, don't have to send it over the uh, links between cities that have the speed of light considerations and, the, and actually a whole lot more in terms of the switches and, and inelegant routing that gets done in the name of saving money, and keep that within the community. So all of that implies a local infrastructure, a local infrastructure which is sometimes called cloudlets, uh, local clouds, edge computing, fog computing, locavore computing, doing it at a location that is closer to the devices and that takes advantages of streams, takes advantages of locality, and understands that the data is perishable and processes it right away. I think is going to be very important. That's going to be integrated, of course, with artificial intelligence. I think we're going to have predictive, anticipatory uh, digital assistants that help us with that and take a look at these data and streaming and work in parallel with us to act as an assistant to us. We saw a number of uh, people write about that in the 2016 Applications and Services in the year 2021 report that Prasad Kalyam and I uh, co-chaired a workshop on. And the workshop report is, of course, available, Applications and Services in the Year 2021. Uh, talks about a number of these things. And uh, finally, I think that we're going to have very fluid configurations. There's going to be a lot of mobility, a lot of having to figure out how to change things based on new locations, new readings, new requirements. And we're not going to be able to statically optimize systems as we have in the past. We're going to have to design them to be dynamically optimized. There won't be a configuration for your network. There will be a fluid dynamic set of configurations happening and changing in real time for your network. The network configuration will have to move at the speed of life as well. So all of these things imply a new, more fluid, more uh, mobile was not quite is, is a right word, but doesn't describe the uh, complete fluidity uh, to this, and in synchrony with the real world. And if we do that, the digital and the real worlds will begin to merge in ways that I think that some of our kids understand already. I think they already uh, believe that their phone is an integral part of their life, and they couldn't live without it because that digital world has become part of their real world. And I think that there are useful things we can do along the lines of the applications that I've shown that will help people take those applications, bring them into their lives, and maybe make even better use of it than some of the applications we're now seeing on the phones uh, where people are using that uh, currently as something that they're merging their digital world with their real world. So what kinds of smart community applications need to be able to operate at the speed of life? Simple one is collaboration, two or more way collaboration, person to person. I personally believe that telepresence will work a lot better once the latency can be reduced to near zero or perceptually zero. When I can help finish somebody else's sentence, in a teleconference, it's going to be much better than what we have today, where people have to take turns, and uh, creativity is often stifled by the staid way in which we have to communicate. Another thing that has to operate at the speed of life is projecting resources. So projecting, for example, a microscope into a classroom or intelligence to a robot, 
or um, instructor into virtual reality. These kinds of projections are going to be uh, really very important. And they're the ones that do involve some non-local things. In this category of projecting a resource, I think there is some locality. I think that the robots are probably going to be projected in intelligence from near and in their locality. But there may be some reasons to do that over a greater distance as well. So distance will remain, but I think that a lot of things will be more local. And then as I uh, was talking about earlier, cyber physical systems, the Microsoft, can, the, uh, Microsoft, the microscope controls are an example of a cyber physical system where there's a person in the loop who's moving the controls of the microscope, seeing something and saying, oh, uh, those, um, this, um, this uh, rotifer I'm trying to look at is out of focus. I need to change the focus so that the rotifer is in focus, get that rotifer in focus. And when they stop turning the knob, the focus stops changing. So perceptually, that microscope, even though there is some milliseconds of delay, the number of milliseconds of delay is short enough that it appears to be in real life. So what kinds of numbers do we need in order to be able to do that? So here's a graph that goes and shows uh, on a logarithmic axis here what application latency requirements look like. And this is uh, numbers that I've gathered from US Ignite applications like the ones you saw videos of. On the right are the things that can take a long time, 10 seconds, and you can see one second, 100 milliseconds, all the way down to uh, microseconds on the left. And traditional cloud computing can cover the things down to about uh, 60, 70, 80 milliseconds. If, if that is enough, you can do it in the traditional cloud. And so you can do uh, teleconferencing in the traditional cloud, but it's not very good because there are very noticeable delays. It's not yet at the speed of life. But there are also applications uh, that we're looking at to the left. For example, um, uh, human robotic control, controlling robots remotely, um, the uh, telesurgery. Right now, if you get surgery from a robot, the doctor's in the next room. They don't allow that to go out to a network and back. They keep that all very local. If we could get the network to be where it would be short enough delay, then we actually could get the doctor to be somewhere else, to be an expert in the type of surgery you need, and for you to get that expert surgeon, even though that surgeon is not in your city or community. If we can get the latency low enough that they can effectively do that surgery remotely with that latency. But I think we're going to have to figure out ways of reducing the latency to make that happen. And you can see a number of other applications. A very um, iconic one is Lola, the low latency music performance software. This allows a number of musicians in different locations to be able to perform as an ensemble. And if you're a musician yourself, you know that if you're performing in an ensemble, you need to hear everybody else in real time at the speed of life to be able to blend your instrument or voice with theirs and make it sound as though it's an ensemble as, instead of just uh, three or four or five people playing. So I think that this can be addressed with edge clouds that get rid of a number of the hops and get rid of a number of the uh, just Einstein delays and distances. And I think it's very possible to do great Lola work if you can keep an edge cloud being the one coordinating the instruments playing together, or the electrical grid playing together from synchrophasers, or the remote surgery. And I think a lot of uh, emphasis in the next couple of years in smart city services are going to be this a uh, box to the left that goes and shows you that we've got a whole new set of applications at the speed of life that are going to make a significant difference if we have an architecture that allows that to be done quickly enough. And I think that there will be more applications that come even further to the left, but we haven't really thought about them seriously because now it goes beyond the speed of life and it goes to the speed of machines. And so there were going to be applications that need to run at the speed of machines, which means even tighter latency requirements to be able to do some of the things that we're going to see and appear to the left of this chart.
So the theme has been digital and physical realities merging. Uh, on the left, you can see the first time this happened uh, in a very popular way. That's Pokemon Go. In Pokemon Go, the uh, animals appear to be in real life. They're uh, overlaid onto real life. It's augmented reality. And I think that was the very first popular uh, version of that. On the right is uh, from a movie where in a future world, uh, the person is looking at and analyzing data by moving their fingers and seeing holographic images in 3D. I'd like to show you a video of a uh, gaming company from Linden, Utah, that's working with not only augmented reality, but making sure that that augmented reality um, and virtual reality is matched to the physical environment that you can also feel and touch as well as see and hear in typical uh, virtual world. So I'll show you this video, but the thing to notice is that the people who are playing these games are actually in a physical environment which matches the one that they're seeing. So they can actually touch the walls. And at one point you're going to see somebody who's touching a panel to go and put in a combination or something uh, to uh, unlock a door or something. In each case, the video is going to show you first the real situation. You'll see the real people and the blank walls that they're actually in. And then that will change and you will see what they see in that environment, that those aren't blank walls. Those are walls that actually have other things in them. Uh, let me just give you a preview here. In one case, you're going to see a person kneel down on the floor. And they're kneeling down on the floor, and that's what's actually going on. However, what they see is when they spread their arms that the walls around them are crumbling. So that's, again, an example of how the physical and the digital realities are going to merge. Let's take a look at a part of that video. Okay, let's say you'd like to do some work in this area of highly responsive applications, computing at the speed of life. What can you use uh, as supporting technologies and what can you do to get the latency down for your applications? Well, I'm trying to make it easy in having a test bed in the smart gigabit communities. So remember that we have these 26 smart gigabit communities around the United States and one in Canada and one in Australia where we are putting in something that we're calling a digital town square. Now, just like the original uh, town squares were the places that the merchants brought their goods and traded them with each other, the digital town square is where all of the gigabit players in that community come and bring their digital information and are able to trade it back and forth. So that digital town square becomes, in essence, a community-centered interconnection point. That interconnection point is also a very local place, a very good place, a logical place is what I was trying to say, 
it makes a logical place where you can go and put local compute so that that local low latency compute that projects, uh, for example, the intelligence into the gigabots can also be at that digital town square. So it's two things, a community edge for competitive compute storage and also a local interchange of that local network traffic. And uh, we're busy doing that in the communities. For the community edge computing, I think this is an open question of what to do. In the left-hand side, you can see a map of the Genie nodes. We are using Genie nodes right now as the stand-in for uh, local compute. Uh, it does work. Uh, however, the Genie project is now complete, and we're getting to a place where, uh, although they're being somewhat maintained, we're looking for what the right thing is to uh, replace them. One of the projects we're working on at US Ignite, and Rick McGear is doing this, is something called EdgeNet, edge-net.org. That's edge-net.org. And it's in alpha right now, so I'm not asking the applications folks to use it very heavily yet because we're still trying to make sure that it's going to be stable. But uh, it's a kind of software-only viral edge computing facility that says, Take whatever you've got, your Raspberry Pi, your small cluster, put EdgeNet on it, and that allows it to be used for these kinds of highly responsive applications. And that uh, colorful diagram you see in the upper right corner is kind of the Digital Town Square logo. Um, let me point out that we have a conference coming up in uh, 2019 in Denver. That 29. Um, that 2019 conference is April 1st through 4th at the Colorado Convention Center in Denver, Colorado. We expect to have about 2,000 people to 2,500 people. It will be the largest smart city conference in the world, as near as we can tell. And I uh, invite all of you to come and join us there. And with that, I'd like to wish you every success for Monatech 2018. Thanks very much.